This is going to be such a great lesson today. We're in Psalms 119, 129 through 136. Um, it's identified with the letter pay because each section starts with the letter pay. But I'm just going to tell you guys right now, this is some powerful, powerful verbiage right now. And I'm blessed. Um, I just spent a lot of great time in this. So I uh, hang on, listen fast. You may have to rewind and go. I've put a lot of stuff. If you know, want right now, if you are watching live and you can, if you already have the Kajabi app downloaded, if not, hurry up and download it. K-A-J-A-B-I and you download it and sign in with your same email, your same password. And when you sign on, you can go to the class and you'll see the downloads. So you'll be able to download the, um, you can go ahead and download the PowerPoint. It's in there. So if you want to go along with me, I'm going to be talking about verses. They're in the PowerPoint. I'm going to be talking about references in Strong's. I'll, they'll be in the PowerPoint. So if you don't want to make a bunch of notes, you can follow along like that. And then I am going to share a resource that I found. And let's see if I can, uh, how well I do this today. Um, let's do this first. You guys let me know if you can see what I need you to see. Hold on. I want you to see this. I just downloaded this into your, uh, I just downloaded this. I don't know how my dog got in here. I just downloaded this into your resources. So it'd be under the welcome and I just downloaded it. So if you guys want to go in there and see it, it is the transliteration of the text because I was having a hard time personally going through and looking at the listening to certain commentaries or I was looking up words and the, even the strongs when I was in the blue letter Bible, it wasn't quite right. I mean, you probably have noticed it that sometimes the more you're studying, don't freak out if you're new. But the more you get to studying and you're looking at it and you're, you start understanding the Hebrew and you look at how they've translated it in, in the Blue Letter Bible, you're like, hmm, hmm. And I love the transliteration because you can like phonetically say what the Hebrew is. It isn't in Hebrew. You can look up the Hebrew anywhere. But I love that this is transliterated. So um, you can go through. And if you're listening to like a rabbi somewhere talking about it, you're like, and he's talking in these, he's saying it. You can actually see, oh, that's how you say that word. I, that's what I love about that. So love, love, love that. So uh, just so you know, I have put that in your um, library already, and it's actually in the, in the uh, course description. And I put, I think, and resources and links. So hold on just a second. Yeah. Yeah. It's in there. All right. So we're going to hop right in and, and get the party going on that part. But I, I just know that those things are available for you already. And Away we go. I'm going to share my sound so you hear that. We're going to have some things I'm sharing a lot today. Again, listen up. We might run a little bit into our Q&A time. I'm willing to stay late for those people who need me to for that, for our, our after party. So again, we're in Psalms 119, 129 through 136. This made me laugh, this picture, because we're going to be talking about the pay and because he had his mouth chewing. That made me laugh. Okay, let's see. Psalm 119, verses 129 through 136. Pay. Your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul keeps them. The entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I do have this link for you I guys also. I opened my in mouth there. and panted, for I Great long to to for your too. commandments. Look upon me and be merciful to me, as your custom is toward those who love your name. Direct my steps by your word, and let no iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from the oppression of man, that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. Rivers of water run down from my eyes because men do not keep your law. I'm going to skip the song today. I did put it in there. I, we don't really have time, but this guy, it's pretty good. It's a little better than some of all, uh, the first part of it you guys can listen to. We have a little bit of a good, you can kind of hear, so it's kind of good, but uh, it's better than some of the ones you can um, hear that are all, you know, twangy and weird. So I all found a different words one. Are wonderful They're not too bad, huh? To so I have that in, in the downloads for you guys so you can listen to the um, listen to that music. Um, I'm going to scoot you guys on though since we've already listened to this. 
In Psalms 119, we have 129 through 136 again, and I'm going to start you guys out in verse 129. It says, your witnesses are wonderful. They're wonders. And, you know, we think about that wonders like we have like, oh, we have the wonders of the world. And the whole point here is I want you to think about that all of the things, the witnesses are beyond fathomable. They're mysterious. They're kind of concealed to us, but we, and we don't have to understand them. We don't have to understand them to actually walk out his mitzvah. And that's the under underpinning of what he's saying here is they're sort, they're unfathomable. They're wonders. They're constantly, a lot of us, as you say, as we're going into the word and as we open up the word that we see that. Um, every week we'll say, or we'll say, when did that get in there? I didn't read that last time I read Psalms 119. I didn't read that last time I was in Torah because it's alive and it's growing. And I laugh and think that new things like kind of little things sneak up there and grow, but it doesn't matter how, how we don't understand it last year. It is, oh, it should be a wondrous, but he says, your witnesses, your adut, your adut, and that's an H5715. And it's actually your precepts your witnesses, your precepts. And the root of that is AYD, A-Y-D. And that is, uh, again, that's phonetic. Uh, it's H5707. And it's something that bears witness or testifies. So it's nice to see sometimes the translation actually got that right to the root. It's something that's testifying. It's something that's proclaiming. So it's saying that this is, he's starting right out by saying that that your witnesses, your precepts, the things that are bearing witness to who you are, the things that testify about who you are, they're wondrous. They're wondrous to, to me. And he says, well, okay, so what are the witnesses? The mitzvah. I should turn this. If you want to come around here, you can. I don't mind. I have a guest. I have a guest, everyone. So she can see the PowerPoints at the same time. What are the witnesses? It's the mitzvahs. Okay. So we know what has to be done. A lot of times we don't know why, and, and we've talked about that before. There's some of the things, his commands, his mitzvahs that we say there, the because I said so's. And what he's saying right here is that he's saying, so I'm going to observe them. Um, I'm going to be observing them, even though they're wondrous, even though these precepts are things I don't understand. And what is not a mystery? Some of the things I know how to do, I don't know why I know how to do it, but that what is, is not a mystery because we know what to do because he spelled it out for us through the word. How do I do this? Will you do it this way? And we say this every week when we say, oh, that didn't, I didn't come with an instruction manual. My kids, my marriage, my work, my friendships, my relationships, they didn't come with an instruction manual. Yeah, they did. He tells us what to do, but the why sometimes is a mystery. Like some things just don't make sense. Like the donkey or, you know, why do you have to break his neck? Like, why do we have to do that? There's some things that are the whys we don't have to know. And that's what he's reinforcing to us in this. Because it is a mystery that we should be so careful. Because this is a mystery to us, because it's wondrous, it's unfathomable to us. He's telling us right now that we have to be so careful to seek him, to be close to him, so that we don't miss that mark. So that we don't sin against him that he's wanting us right here to be, to be so close, to observe them, being there, to observe them is a mystery. So if imagine if it was so easy, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the speed limit, perfect example. There's a speed limit behind my road. I take a back way to get home. And I know that speed limit. I know how to get there. I know I've done it a million times. And when I come down that road, I know what I, I have put on cruise control. I know what the speed limit is. Well, guess what? A couple months ago, they changed the speed limit. So because I don't know, because I'm not used to it yet, because I did get pulled over and uh, we, I laughed and said that I thought it was an urban legend that people got warnings. The, the, the police officer was really great um, and gave me a warning. And I was expecting not to that to happen. I'm not on a back road. It was dark. I was expecting him to, I mean, all the things, right? And I'm like, Father, I just thank you. And he just gave me a warning and said, stop, because I said, I'm sorry. I thought the speed limit was 45. He said, yeah, we, we changed it about two months ago, it's 35. Now, guess what? I'm going to be careful as I go through there because it's a new thing. I'm going to be careful because, because I know it now I'm not going to be on cruise control at 45. I'm going to make sure try to hit it at 35. That's such a loose interpretation of this. I mean, comparing his words, the mystery, the wonders of, of his Torah to that seems so it's a fraction but it needs to be so mysterious to us that we're like, what, what, what's happening next? We have to, it, we're so careful to seek him and be so close to him 
that we don't miss the mark, that we don't miss what he's trying to say. Because you know what? The other thing is this is he may tell it to you one way, the why. He may reveal a why to you of why you're to do something a certain way through a certain mitzvah or for a commandment. And next year, the why is different. So that's how close you have to be to him because his ways are not our ways, right? And in one and then in 130, he says, the opening up of your words gives light, giving understanding to the simple. The opening up of your words gives light. The root of that is debar, which is really strange to me. The word for your words, your words give light. Debar is 8, 16, 96. And we, we see like we've used debar before, but I, I looked at this a little different because I want us to look at this section. We're going to start looking at this as a shepherd. Who's the shepherd writing this psalm? And we're going to end the last verse in this talking about who's the king writing this song and who is the king of kings who will ultimately write the song? Who's the king of kings who will be that ultimate pay? Huh? Pun intended. So who's going to be that, right? He says, I'm opening these words, the debar. So let's look at this word debar now from the shepherd's point of view. He says, set things in a row range them in orders. And I was thinking you put letters, letters in order to make words. So, and we're talking about words. So we're setting things in order. And then the next part of that, the little sprinkles and icing, if you watch Brenda and I's uh, blue letter Bible for not so dummies, you'll, you'll, you'll know, we talk about the bold letter, right? All caps. But if you start looking at the icing and the sprinkle underneath the, 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 uh, Gesenius and the Chaldee, the Gal Caldi, Cal Caldi, uh, lexicon, you're going to see that the sprinkles say to lead and guide flocks. Wait a minute, that's a shepherd term, to direct and to bring order. So we're talking about pay. Every single one of these is starting with the letter pay. And I'll just, the, the preliminaries to say pay, mouth, words, things come out of your mouth, you speak. That's kind of the base, so basic of that. But think about this, the words set things in a row. I'm going to set things in order. I'm going to direct and I'm going to order things so I can bring orders to things. So what happens? Opening your words gives light. In verse 130, the Torah it continues. The Torah is called or, right? Have you heard of that before? We talk about the Torah being the light, the or. His word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. We did that earlier in other verses in this thing. And we're talking about not just your IQ, knowing that the light is the Torah, but it's also your emotional intelligence. It's, you know, that it goes beyond just the, you, it goes to the Torah. It goes to everyone. He's saying it's a light and we work at it. it the more we're working at it, the more our eyes are illuminated. The more that we, he's saying, the more that you open this up, the more that opening up these words are, the more your eyes are illumined. Have you had that experience? Have you had the experience that the more you're studying, the more you're in his word, the more your eyes become illuminated. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And that's in first Corinthians one twenty-seven. And you may have heard it in King James. I think it says he chooses the, the weak to confound the wise or the foolish things to confound the wise. And, and in this section, when he's saying, uh, he's saying, giving understanding to the simple, that's what I have in the scriptures translation, the opening of your words gives light or, and it gives understanding to the simple. Well, 1 Corinthians 127, this is not new concepts. He's referring back to saying his light, God chooses to bring light to his word to make, and we've heard over and over, it is not too hard. It is not too hard. And there's levels. The more you get in, you'll see, you know, you all know this. The deeper you get in, the deeper those levels begin to open up. The light starts to shine in and you're like, oh. I never saw that path before. And he starts showing you a secret path around. He starts showing you another dimension around. Ooh, these trees, these shrubs, these flowers, the smells start changing. It becomes dimensional to you, but he doesn't overwhelm you at first. He will open up that path and the foolish things that you think, oh, these people are foolish. He makes it so simple that as that light sheds on there, he's saying he gives understanding to the simple. What he's saying is the more we learn, the more we're going to understand. In verse 130, uh, he, uh, I'll continue on that. He's saying that another interpretation, this, it could be this, your first words are, are illuminating things. Okay, wait, what? If you go back and read this in the original Hebrew, it says the opening of your words 
wait a minute, the opening of your words, when were the words opened? When did he first speak? And when were the words first opened? Hope my husband doesn't listen to this because I cannot get him out of Genesis 1. For those of you in creation gospel, you get it. The first time he spoke, he said, Vai or. Yeah. yeah, that was directly from a rabbi speaking that. So I wrote it. He said, Vai or. And I was like, okay, I wrote it how he said it phonetically. And then if you look it up, it's high, it's written as I have on here on the slide. It's written in the uh, Strong's. That's how they've interpreted it. You know what, you guys? It doesn't matter. The words are the words, but it's light be. We, we translate it, let there be light. But the first time he starts speaking, he starts, his words, be, his words created. So what if we go back and look at 130 and say, the opening of your word gives light. The opening of your words started creating. The opening of your words began breaking the darkness. The opening of your words began to pierce through the misunderstanding and the chaos. And his words illuminated the world that we know now. Even the most simple words can make the fools wise. The simple, simplest words can make the fools wise. Simple face, emunah, illuminates all areas of our life. So if we're saying even, this, even his initial creative words, what if we just can, the simple, simple things, what if we can get so elementary that we say, all we have to say is to every situation, light be, light be. What if that's all we have to say? What's, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I, what if it's, what, what if it's that simple? What if that emuna of thinking, all I have to say is father speak light into this dark thing and it will illuminate all the areas of your life. Just recognizing that God created all life and light brings wisdom. Just that recognition of that. Yeshua is the light. There was no greater or no lesser light. So if you think about it, when he said light be, he was, he was not proclaiming something that wasn't. He wasn't creating the greater light or the lesser light. He wasn't creating the sun, moon, stars. So where's this light? And I was praying about that. And I'm like, if you just said there was no greater, no lesser light. And if you say light be, and you're saying here in your verses that opening up your words, oh wait, Yeshua is the words. It gives light then wouldn't we say that opening up your word, he's the word, he's the light. We don't lean on our own understanding. We trust in the Lord with all our heart, lean not on our own understanding. In all our ways, acknowledge him and he directs our path. Doesn't that align with that? Isn't Proverbs, wouldn't that make sense that the son of the, of the man who wrote this would write this? Because he was taught back from his father. If I trust in the light, if I trust in the word, I trust in the power of Messiah that his light is what illuminates the word because he's the word. He's all the things. I, I'm so big. I don't even know. I feel like I, I can't even, it's, it's so big. He's the word. He's the light. And if we go back and read this differently and say, well, opening up, opening up or getting close to letting him align us with Yeshua, our Messiah brings illumination brings light to our life. It gives us understanding even to the simple. Who did, who did Yeshua come to? Who did he come to? I have a, um, I'm going to go to this really quick because I don't think I could explain it as well as this rabbi did. So I'm going to give you a quick, quick little thing. I'm going to escape out of this and take you to this 4520. Let me know if you guys can see it. Are you here? I don't think so. I think I have to stop sharing and come back in. I'm going to learn how to do this transition. Um, I understand there is a way. If I do this, and then I go to let the sun shine in. Oh, did I delete it? No, I didn't. Okay. okay. Can you guys see that? You can. You can hear it. I know. So I remember my upshare initiative because it was traumatic for me. I remember being traumatized by the idea of cutting my hair. So this All right. Must have been very Sorry, I listened to this at what crazy speeds. Traumatized me. So I grew up in a family of Hasidim. My parents are Hasidim. Both sets of grandparents are Hasidim Baruch Hashem. And everybody reveres the Rebbe. And the Rebbe is the perfect, the perfect Jew. He is, he is everything we aspire to. He's a holy man, a godly man. The Rebbe knows your thoughts. His erudition in Torah is unmatched in the world. These are the kind of things that, that I know. And I hear the Rebbe say 
Bishas has Mashiach with Kumin with Zaina Cheshach Atzmeyor. When Mashiach will come, it says the darkness itself will illuminate. I can understand that. And then he said, Vodas meint, Veis Kenenisht. What that means, nobody knows. Vaharaye, Zichalein Veisnit. Because I myself don't know. And I think that I was so traumatized to hear the Rebbe say publicly that there was something he didn't know that these words burned themselves into my memory and I cannot shake them. So my dear friends, if you will ask me to explain to you the meaning of it doesn't mean when you turn the lights on that there's no longer any darkness. That means when light dispels darkness. But when Mashiach comes, the chayshech, the darkness, the darkness itself will be light. And the Rebbe himself said he didn't know what that meant. We have no experience. We have no frame of reference for that. It hasn't yet happened. But this is the purpose. This is the goal. This is the intention. And so, these are the two schools of thought, said the Rebbe. The two schools of thought are, Rebbe Nechemia holds that the ultimate purpose is light. However, Ha'olam Nivrat Chila. The world was created first. Why? Why? Because... The world had to be created even before God brought light into existence because the tachlis, the ultimate purpose, is not simply to banish or do away with the darkness, but rather to use the darkness as a springboard, as a launching pad, as a conventional vehicle through which we can actualize the presence of light. In other words, that the chayshech becomes an envelope, an imtsoi, legales, as her to reveal the light. When you do a mitzvah, you're revealing the light. We don't see it, but that's what you're doing. And the only way you can do a mitzvah in a meaningful fashion is if there's the possibility of not doing the mitzvah. And that requires chayshach. That requires darkness. So the darkness is necessary because it's only through the darkness that I'm able to have the ability to choose and to bring light into the world. So darkness is a reality and it was created before light because it is the launching pad for light it is what enables light to be brought into the world that's how the Rebbe understands the school of thought that's advanced by Rabbi Nechemia Charlie, you're muted. Hold on a second. Thank you. Okay. So I put that link also in, in your, um, in, in your library. So you can see that. And I have, and I also in the PowerPoint telling you just where to start at that. I always speed it up. I always listen to it a little faster. Um, so, um, he's a nice slow talker. So I'm a fast listener. My husband laughs when he hears me listening to him. Cause it's like, and then I hear something and I slow it down. So did you guys hear when he said, we have no point of reference for this, that when light comes, it will dispel the darkness. When Mash Mashiach comes, he will dispel the darkness. He says, we don't have any point of reference. Hallelujah. Y'all, we have a point of reference. When Messiah Yeshua came, darkness itself, it becomes light. So if you heard him say dark, darkness is that launching pad for light, even darkness will be transformed to light. And I have some verses. I'm going to overwhelm you with them. John 9, 5, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Micah 7, 8, though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Psalms 18, 28, my God turns my darkness into light. John's 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. John can't overcome the light. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Uh, John, uh, 1 John 1, 5 through 9, this is the message we have heard from him and declare it to you. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light and he is the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, Yeshua, his son purifies us from all sin. And if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the trust is not in us. I mean, you should be hearing the verbiage of David here. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Psalms 139, 11 through 12. Surely the darkness will hide me and the light became night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is a light to you. And we have John 12, 35 through 30, 27. Oh, I think that's supposed to be 37. Sorry, guys. Through 37. I, I love when I do this because I see all the corrections to go back and make. Then, then Yeshua told them, you are going to have the light just a little more longer. Oh, wait, who's he talking about? Himself. He's the light. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they're going. Believe in the light where you have the light so that you may become children of light. Do you guys hear that? When we're walking with him, when you're close to him, we now have the opportunity to become the children of light. And when he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. And after, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still could not believe them. First Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen people, your royal priesthood, a holy nation. God, oh, wait a minute. This is, this is the Brit Hadashah. This is New Testament here. Who's he, where did, where have we heard this before? God's special possession, right? You are the Kohanim that you may declare the pray. Why are you that? Not just so you can walk around and be like, oh, I'm special. No, so that you can declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. He saw you and said, light be. He saw every situation that you were in. He's saying he called you out of that darkness. And then Revelations 21, there were so many. I just picked a few. Just look up verses about light and you can just be in there for a while. So Revelations 21, 23, he says, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light. And the lamb is its lamp. It's the vessel of the light. Yeshua was the vessel of that light. This is a reflection of pre-creation. We're back to Genesis 1.1. When the city doesn't need a greater light or a lesser light, it doesn't need sun, moon, and stars because it has the light. All right. At the top of there, I did start putting this, these verses across in Hebrew. So those of you who want to see it in Hebrew, you can see it with all the dots and tittles and things. This is 131. We have a shift now happening. We're going to shift from the desire to David's desire for Torah. And he's going to say in 131, he says, I have opened my mouth and panted for I longed for your commands. He, my mouth opened. This is, this is like, a, I'm going to give you a, a, a better or not a better, a different, a more a rude, a crude uh, translation. My mouth opened and I swallowed, but I couldn't swallow quick enough. You know, it was a fire hydrant. Like I opened my mouth expecting a, all these things. They Shopa to swallow deeply, he says, I, to swallow deeply. He panted because I wanted it. Hazinu, Moshe uses a similar metaphor in that, in that Parsha about opening your mouth, catching the rain, that the word would be like rain, where you would open your mouth up and, and it would just pour into your mouth and you couldn't get enough. The metaphor of opening a mouth for rain is perfect because he's opening his mouth and this, this verse is like he's gulping. I want you to see it as not like, oh, I opened my mouth like a little, oh, like you put lipstick on. No, he opened his mouth and he's gulping it. He, he's so hungry. He wants it to come in as fast. And you notice he's not saying, I waited for the food to be prepared for me. And you don't hear any reference to chewing in this verse. You, you, he, he wants to get as much as he can and just swallow is what, what is being said in this verse in the original Hebrew. He's saying the picture, the hieroglyphic is him opening his mouth and just water, like high, you know, big old fire hydrant going in. He's gulping as fast as he can. It's like going to Dr. Alwine's class. You're just like, it's fire hydrant coming as fast as it can. And so he, before he can swallow it, this is the, so that's why the water metaphor is really good. When we look, think about explaining this verse using a metaphor of water because it's not talking about chewing it's not talking about preparation which would be necessary for food and this is a description of the excitement and the anticipation that we should have look excuse me looking into torah and i think of my dog baxter panting and drooling when he sees us preparing his food he starts panting and he starts drooling because and he's gonna gulp it as fast as he can because he's anticipating the good thing it's like being desperate for air. Have you ever been in a stale room 
maybe there's smokers or someone has a really strong cologne or perfume on and you're desperate to get fresh air. It's so stale. That's how we should feel. That's what he, that's how David is saying he is right now, that he is desperate. And once don't expect, can I just be honest here? Don't expect this is, if this is new to you and you haven't begun, don't expect this to be a natural thing where you're like, Oh, I can wait. It's, it's natural that you're like, this is hard. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. That's why we're here. We want you to reach out to us so that eventually you will get to the place the same way that David is. He didn't just jump into this place. He's in this place because he, he is, he's been in here for forever, right? He's been in the word. The, the word's been pouring over him. The father's been, been teaching us. So good. I, I don't want to look at chat, so I got to keep going. I got lots in here. So it's like being desperate. It's like needing oxygen. You just can't live without it. Without Torah, you honestly can't live. You will get to a point where you, I've gone, I've gone times when I intermittently did the Torah portion, intermittent, I didn't finish. And then finally I got to a place where I was determined. I'm going to go one whole year where I don't miss a Torah portion. Like I don't miss not reading it. Now, of course, in the last eight years, because you're teaching it, there's a good way to get you to read it is you got to teach it, teach it to your kids, teach it to whatever, but you have to read it. But I feel now like if I'm not in it, I can't live. And I actually grieve when I get to the end of the Torah portion, because I felt like I haven't had enough time in it. Now I'm longing with mouth open, gaping. I can't wait for next year to see what he's going to pour into it. He says he opened his mouth without needing a taste. He didn't need a taste. Just taste and see that it's good. No, he wasn't going, I just give me a little sample. No, he's opening his mouth saying, give, give, it, give it to me. I'm, I'm opening my mouth. I'm, ga ga I'm panting. And you can crave like this too. You can pant and desire for that. Then we're in verse 133. And 133, he says, establish my footsteps by your word and let no wickedness have rule over me. And again, that's that verse above it is in Hebrew. Uh, Psalm 74, we hear him saying simple, similar things about uh, lifting his footsteps. This isn't about walking. This isn't about a journey. This is, doesn't, this is about not allowing your feet to go where they ever they want to go on their own. It's about lifting my feet up and, and guiding my footsteps. Because otherwise I'm going to go in crazy places. I'm going to, I truly will walk to crazy town without any help. So God, please help me stay on this path. So why does, why does Torah require a journey? Why does it require it? The reason is because it says hatat, sin crouches at the door. So we have to get prepared for the journey. You have to get immersed because it's crouching at the door. The minute your steps walk out, David is referring to this. He's like, I know that the minute I step out of this, I already know that my feet are going to go to crazy town. I know they're going to do the wrong thing. So I have to immerse myself because it's crouching at the door. I want to be ready. I want to be immersed so that that doesn't happen. And there's a vav in here. It says, and, right? It says, um, I have opened my mouth. Uh, where are we at? Let me make sure I'm at the right. 133. Yeah. Establish my footsteps and let no wickedness have rule over me. That vav in there, that and, that there will be no iniquity that will have power over me. This is what he's saying. I'm going to do all these things and there is no iniquity that will have power over me. If you're rooted in Torah, the evil inclination, it will not rule over you. Footsteps. They're not just transportation here, but they're the path we follow. It, it's what we become second nature. I want you to go back to the the shepherd thoughts. Now, if I'm a shepherd, if I'm a shepherd, what happens with sheep? They go over and over in the same place and they wear a path. They wear a path. Wait a second. Okay. Look at this again. Shepherd language. The sheep know the trail. If he's guiding the path, this is shepherd language. Lead me in this place. Guide my footsteps. That's what a shepherd does. And what ends up happening is a, is a trail. Have you guys ever seen a, a, if you've ever seen like a deer path or any kind of a, a animals, they will make paths and they get into a groove and we'll say, oh, I'm in a rut, right? What does, what does that mean? It means I got into a thing I'm used to and I go along the path. If we're immersed in him, we don't have to worry about sin being crouched at the door because we're going to get into that place like a sheep and we're going to go into that trail and it becomes second nature then for us to go because we know what 
green pasture to green pasture to green pasture, there's only going to be a few of the rogue sheep because that don't know his voice and haven't been on the path. They're the newbies. And they're going to be looking over and seeing something like, oh, that looks interesting. And they're going to go off. What David's saying, don't let me be that sheep. Don't let me be that sheep that goes off. But I want you to, to lift my feet up and put them in the rut, put them in that groove. Because if they go their own way, the shepherd then has to make corrections. And I think David knows all too well what those corrections can look like. It could look like a broken leg and being hung over the shepherd's neck, right? In 34, he says, redeem me from the oppressed of man that I might guard your orders. Pada, redeem me, 6299, loose me, set me free. So that I may keep, shamar. This is a word that you should feel like we've beat you up with, but here you go again. It's um, Hebrew 8104. It's to keep, to watch, to guard. Think like a shepherd in this, you guys. What does it look like to shamar if he's guarding, protecting the sheep? But it also means honoring and worshiping. And then he says in the next, in 35, and this is the verse to the left is in Hebrew. He says, make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your laws. Show me favor. Okay, I'm going to go third level on this. I'm going to go third level, rabbinic third level. So some of you maybe need to go to coffee. So here we go. Third level on this is that he's saying, when he's talking about sh make your face shine upon me, it, not, it doesn't just mean at surface level is show me favor. Look upon me, smile upon me for a second level. I'm going to go another level on this. He's saying that he would actually have the image of God and his face would be illuminated. That he would... The, the, when his face would shine upon me, meaning that my I would then reflect your face shining upon others. Why, and then we're going to, they're going to find that. So why is this making him cry? We'll see this in a second. Moshe number six, may God cause his countenance to shine upon you. You know, we're going to see him, Moshe, repeating this over. This is, this is why David knows this. He knows that the glory of the Lord shone on Moshe's face. Remember, at some point, he even had to put a veil over him his face, because it was shining so bright. David's desiring here, shine your face upon me. So when you're just like going, oh, I'm gonna do the Arianic blessing. May, the, may his face shine upon you. I want you to think about this to third level, okay? True wisdom impacts your appearance. When you're digging deep in the word and you're getting true wisdom from the word, it should impact your appearance. You glow from within. That divine spark inside of you shines and that's what people see. And your, your, your sphere of influence is impacted. All of everything around you is, they see that. Something should be different about you. Something should be shining forth in you. And that piece of godliness should illuminate from you. This isn't just him shining. This is saying, burn everything away from me so that everything is in you is shining. And I'm reflecting your glory. I'm a reflection. As you look at me, it isn't just for me. That favor isn't just for me. I want to, yeah, your favor to come upon me so it reflects out to everyone else it's not just and when he says then streams of tears flowed from my eyes these weren't just little tears you guys it says he was weeping streams my eyes my ayin it's really interesting you know you have the ayin just last week ayin comes before the pay right we have to see things sometimes before we say things because our eyes are the first thing that we capture things and then it then it ends up coming to our mouth right because our, our, the abundance of our, how, our heart, we'll see later, our mouth is, speaks. But, but my, his eyes now, let's, he's going to go back and go back to his eyes. Now, we know David. We know that one of David's issues was the sin of his eyes. Now, he was a king. He could go after any woman he wanted. Married, not married. That's why we see Abraham. That's why we, see, we, see, we make fun of the patriarchs for, I can't believe you're going to give your wife away. It wasn't that. The kings had every right to take any woman they wanted and kill the husband. That's what David did. He took the right. He took the woman that he saw and he killed the husband. It was, a, it was a king's right to do that if he wanted. It was expected. If he saw a woman he wanted, he took him and had the husband killed. He's saying, my eyes, my eyes, they've sinned, Father. Sinners stray after what his eyes see. His eyes go, the ayin, right? His eyes go, then his mouth starts going that way, and then he heads that direction. Why are we talking about Teshuvah right now? Why after all of this stuff, when he's seeking his word, he's... What's happened now is he's saying, you've shown your face on me, you've purified me, and it's revealed to me by soul. Not just like, oh yeah, I lied today. No, my soul, and I've realized that my eyes have sinned. And I'm asking you from revealing my soul, 
atonement should burst forth. You should be, it should, it should atonement should be seen and teshuva should happen for the sin of the eyes. Can you guys see that those tears were like a, the, like a mikvah? The tears were washing away the sin of his eyes, the ma'im flooding through his eyes. It wasn't just, oh, a tear trickled down. He says, my, I was weeping. Rivers came through. He was, he was washing out because that would have been living water, washing out whatever his eyes had appeared. That was part of his teshuva. That's what he felt. That's what should happen. I, that was just so beautiful to me that this monarch cried because the people didn't honor Torah. Wait a minute. In Luke 19, 41 through 42, Yeshua says, and he came near and saw the city and he wept over it saying, what, where did he weep? Jerusalem, right? If you, even you had only recognized this day that the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. We see King David and now King Yeshua weeping over the people because the other way to interpret this is the king was weeping because the people had not grasped Torah. They weren't grasping it. They weren't guarding it. They weren't seeing it because they did not guard. Now they could be his eyes or they could be the people. There's a split in the thought, but who cares, right? We talk about that. If you're, if you're going to split that, you're missing the point. The point is his eyes did cause him to sin. And yes, those would have washed it away. But also he, he can say they, the people are not, he's seeing that they're not guarding the Torah and he's weeping for them. And isn't this a beautiful reflection? We see our King Mashiach weeping saying that you didn't see, you didn't see. All right, let's see if I can do this for you guys. I have to, I have to switch. I have to switch roles here. So my, Crystal, we're gonna, we're gonna do skill development on this, huh? It'll be a better switch over for you guys. Let's see if I can find it. Um, I may not have kept it for you. I posted a cartoon about pay. It's a really cute little car cartoon. It's talking about what I see and what I say. And um, let me see if I can. Oh, I did. Yay. You guys can see this. Now, Miri, what's the most powerful part of your body? Your hands, your brain, your... I think it's my mouth. How did you guess? Well, it gets a lot of exercise. Your mouth is powerful because it brings inside that which was outside and brings outside that which was inside. That's weird. Take a look. Here's the letter P. P means mouth. What do you see inside? Hey, there's a bat inside. The bet is the wisdom that's inside, and the pay brings it out. But what if you don't have any wisdom inside? Then it's better to keep the pay closed. And what if you start talking uh, about somebody else? Well, then you bring out whatever's inside that person. If you speak bad things about that person, you bring out that bad even worse. But if you speak good things about somebody? Then you bring out the good in that person and make it shine. Okay, just a couple more slides and we're ready to go. If you are, we're just going to talk about pay quickly because you, I really encourage you to go to Brenda's class, Discovering the Energy of the Letters, and you're going to dive deep into not just what's the letter, where's Yeshua, what's it all about, what's the history of the letter. You're going to see this, the letter floating all around. But wasn't that beautiful in that cartoon where he was like, I see the bait inside. You see that when you see the house, when you see all the amazing things that are built in the house and protected in the house, then that's what comes in. But if your house is full of junk, junk is what comes out, right? It means the mouth uh, a bent pay means a closed mouth, and that straight so feet means an open mouth. So think on those things. <laughs> and then we have the connection. 
there's the connection between Matthew 12, 34 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we see that in the Psalms that we've been reading. We're looking at what is in the abundance of me? Is it causing that your light to shine? Am I shining forth the light? Do I have that bait? Have I, am I going back to the garden, the bait? Am I speaking garden language to people? Is that what's coming out of my mouth? Moshe is this prototype of this pay, right? Because he speaks. First we start, he's impaired, but then he speaks as the spokesperson for God. And then finally, the ayin is before the pay because we really always see before we speak. All right, let's finalize this up before we open up for our after party here. And let's say, Father, may you know, we know that your testimonies are wonderful. May our souls obey them. May the unfolding of your words give us light and may we gain understanding. May we open our mouths wide to pant as we long for your commandments. May we know that you turn us into graciousness towards us, your face. May we love your name and may our footsteps be directed in your word. May no iniquity have master over us. May we be redeemed from the human oppression and may we keep your precepts. May we know that your face shines on your servants and may we learn your decrees. May streams of water run down from our eyes and may we not be like those who do not observe your Torah. Amen.